Beloved, I received a message from the Acting Commissioner of Police, Ms. Novlet Grant. The topic of the message, pretty long, that she sent was, love me to live, don't love me to death. A few excerpts from that message. Jamaica has a persistent problem of violence, underpinned by domestic and gender-based violence and abuse. Too many persons in intimate relationships in Jamaica are being loved to death. In 2016, 24 women in Jamaica were killed by men who were purported to love them. This deadly love has left a trail of broken families. It is time for us to reflect on how we treat each other. The church is being asked to assist in the campaign to educate all. In the light of that message and in the light of today's gospel, I thought we would be, it would be good of us to reminisce and to be reminded of that which we already know, but somehow we have to keep putting into practice lest we forget, lest we become victims of that which is around us. How do we confront the experiences of life as disciples of Christ? What is the difference that you and I should make in our world when we are no different from any other human being except the fact that you and I acclaim Jesus as our Savior and our Lord? The first thing is this. In the Gospel, Jesus says, Give to those who ask. There's a certain truth, beloved. I will give if I have. I cannot give what I don't have. If I do not have self-love, healthy self-love, how can I then be expected to enter into any relationship of love and share love with someone else? Lest we forget, Scripture says, you and I are fearfully, wonderfully made. We are all made in the image and likeness of our God. And we are told that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what the opinions of others are. You and I can rest assured that because God shaped and fashioned and formed us into life, he calls us, dare I say, he commands us to love the self. If you and I have enough healthy, respectful self-love, it will then demand mutuality in terms of how we share life with each other and recognize the dignity and the respect that is to be given to every single person. No individual who loves the self will ever put up with abuse, whether verbal or physical. Humility does not mean that you're a doormat. Humility means recognizing that God is God and I am not God. God is the one who saves, I merely comply with his will. God pours grace upon me so that I can learn, despite my deficiencies, how to love myself. A few years ago, I visited the female prison ministry, and I was struck by this inmate. She was dressed to the max and to the T. She stood out from all the others because of the incredible outfit that she wore. And I remember my eyes seeing hers and hers seeing mine, and she says, Father, I need to talk to you. I recognized that she was dressing that way, not just because she loved herself, but it probably was a way to escape mentally the environment. I listened to her story. She says, Father, I had everything I needed, but my husband verbally and physically abused me. I kept it up for a long time. Eventually, I could not take it anymore. And so one day, I snapped. I killed him, chopped him up, and dumped him. And I will never forget her words to me. She says, Father, go and tell the young girls this, that no amount of money or material things that someone promises you is ever going to be enough to put up with abuse of any kind. I learned my lesson. Sad to say it ended this way, and I need you, Father, to go and tell others. Do not allow the lure of the material to allow you to put up with abuse from others. 
Beloved, if you and I understand that our true value is with our God who has placed each of us here to grow in his love, then we will never allow room for any verbal or physical abuse to come our way. Love yourselves as you are loved by Jesus. When he came to us, he says, I have come that you may have a quality of life and have it abundantly. At no time does Jesus ever say we are to put up with abuse. He says, love yourself. Love God, love the neighbor, and love self. If you and I then understand that loving self is the first step in confronting the issues of life, we are then reminded that we are not created alone, but we are stepping out to encounter others. Loving the other. Who is the other? Every human being comes from different backgrounds. In one context, the child may grow up with loving parents, with a family who confirms and affirms a child. The child learns how to develop self-confidence self-love and is able to extend that to others. However, in another context, absent parents, overly dominant family and friends may erode the child's confidence. In fact, the child who grows up in an abusive home, even though he or she tries, usually becomes abusive later on as an adult. Those of you young people who plan to get married, I beg of you, Take time to learn who the other is. People seem to be too quick to jump into relationships these days. It seems that we have forgotten what it means to learn who the self is and learn who the other is. The journey of self-discovery is a lifetime journey. Last year I may like pizza, today I may want chocolate cake. And if I am so dynamic in that I change from one year to the next, how much more difficult it is to truly get a grip on who the other is and how I will spend my life relating to that person or to the people that God sends. When Jesus invites us to follow him, he says, pay attention. Pray for the spirit of discernment. Because when we encounter others, it is then that Jesus says, take time to know the other. In the Eastern world, arranged marriages may work for some, but we are not in the East. We're in the Western world, where dating is a way of life. And in that time and that space, beloved, take the time to learn who the other is. Do not rush into love, because you do not know what you are getting. Although reference was made of women being murdered, I'll never forget the experience I had again a few years ago. A young, handsome, well-built police officer came to my office. And he says, Father, I want you to pray for me. To which I said, sure, I, I understand. You must have it hard, eh? Going out there facing these criminals with these high-powered rifles, it must be really tough on you. And he said to me, no, Father, I know that's my job. I know I have to go out and confront these criminals. It's what's happening in the home that's scaring me. I say, what happened? He says, I am dating another police officer. And one day she looked at me and, and said, I love you so much that if you ever think of leaving me, I will shoot you and shoot myself. It works both ways. And we all have to be conscious of the people in our lives. If you encounter people with whom you click, then thank God and celebrate because those are gifts from God. But if for whatever reason you do not click, have the courage to ask the question, how much of a distance do I need to put between myself and this person or these others? Some people never really grow up. If the other is constantly negative, never having anything good to say at any time, always overly critical, uses abusive and even demeaning words. Danger, red flag, red light. Time to take a look and answer that question. Beloved, if physical abuse ever takes place yesterday, 
What's going to prevent it from happening tomorrow? And so we all need to ask ourselves, is it worth it being in a relationship where I may be hit tomorrow on the face, but tomorrow I may have some part of me chopped off? This is not a sermon on sociology or psychology. We come to church to understand our spiritual lives. So in the context of all of this that's happening in our country, what is expected of us? There's a question that I'm going to ask you that's going to disturb you. It is something we hear all the time, but somehow it seems to always get dismissed. When you and I encounter pain from others, what is our response? People will hurt us. People will want to abuse us. People will say all kinds of things against us. What is your and my response? The human inclination is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. You did something that eroded my trust, I'm going to have my revenge. I demand recompense. That's a human level. That's understandable. But notice what happens in today's gospel reading. Jesus goes one step further, as he always does. He says, when you encounter people who cause pain, for whatever reason, pray for them and bless them. So my question to you today, beloved, is this. When we encounter pain, whether inside the home or outside, wherever we go, what is my response? Is it that which is earthly and all too human? Or is it that which elevates us as a people of God? Jesus says this, when you pray for those who persecute you and show love to them, that is when you show the world that you are my disciples. Because if you and I don't make a difference, then we are merely sentinels passing through this world. And if you and I are not prepared to pray for the people who persecute us and call us pain, then coming to church is just another event that we tick off for the week without having an effect on our lives. When Jesus calls us, he says, I am going to give you what you need to carry on the journey. But how many of God's people, as we hear in the first reading, continue to harbor each other in their hearts, hating, seeking revenge, allowing the devil or other voices to lead us from what God desires and what God wants? Do we really take Jesus and his words seriously? Or do we prefer to listen to our own emotions and the people that we call our circle of friends? If you and I don't make a difference, how are we going to confront the world around us? Bless your persecutors, Jesus says. Allow them to understand that God is love. When we speak of love and forgiveness and mercy, those who do not know God see these traits as weaknesses. But we all must remember, in the eyes of God, we are already condemned. In the eyes of God, we are already guilty. And the only reason why we are saved is because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And when we allow him to bathe us with his blood and pour his grace upon us, he renews us, he refreshes us, and he says, what I have done for you, you must now be prepared to do for others. Sometimes we love people up close because you link and you click. Sometimes you have to love them at a distance because they have shown over and over they are spiritually and psychologically immature, so you have to love them at a distance. But at no time do you and I ever have permission to hate someone, to think ill of someone, to speak ill of someone, or to do harm to anyone. You and I must be the face of the merciful God that we experience in our daily lives. Beloved, ours is a task to teach, to educate ourselves, our family and children, what is right and what is wrong. What is good, what is bad. Never forget this. We don't all grow at the same rate. For whatever reason, we grow at different stages. There are some who hear just the word and they respond automatically. They are few and far between. 
There are many who hear the word, but they are still at that plateau. They haven't yet learned how to grow. And then there are many who hear the word, but they fall flat. What then is expected of God's people? Simple example. Timmy's mother says to him, Timmy, stop taking out the cookies. Apart from it not being good for you, you are spoiling your appetite and you're not thinking of others in the house. But Timmy does not listen, and so he goes and he takes the cookies again. Timmy's mother, Joy, says to his father, Timmy, not listening. So, like a good daddy, he says, you deal with it. So mommy takes the cookie jar and places further up in the cupboard. Timmy, being a good Jamaican, knows how to get around. So he searches for a chair, stands on the chair, reaches for the cookie, and takes out the cookies. Mommy goes to Daddy. Timmy is still not listening. What do we do? Daddy says, Timmy is our son. We have to help him, not throw him out. So what does Daddy do? Daddy takes the cookie jar, puts it in a bread basket, gets a lock, closes the lock, Finally, Timmy gets the message. By word, by example, and by structure, we have to help each other to grow. Not condemn, not turn our backs on each other, not discard the other. By word, by example, and by structure, we have to help each other to grow. Why should we do this? We do it because this is what Jesus invites us to do. We do it as proof of our love for God and love for each other. We need God to do this because God is our ultimate reward. These words may sound foolish to many, but they are the words of God. And when Jesus speaks, he says, my words, they are spirit and they are life. If you and I don't know the word, spend time with the word, then we must be prepared to be disturbed and even challenged by the word. Never forget God desires all of us to be saved, no matter how far one has strayed. And the Holy Spirit who dwells in us gives us the strength and courage to love the saint and the sinner, to teach and live for the salvation of all, and to live lives of genuine love so as to bring out the best in each other. If you remember nothing from this morning's homily, although you can always visit our Facebook and website, Remember that last line. You and I must live our lives so that we bring out the best in each other. That's what we're called to do. That's how we see the spirit at work in the lives of all that God loves. When we learn how to live our lives to bring out that which is the best in the other, hopefully then we will hear our God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. To our God of life, love and mercy, be glory and praise forever and ever.